I think some, I think we tend to have all of us together collect, collectively at this point. I think we, we tend to get caught up in, in Nephilim tunnel vision. Yeah. <laughs> Everything, here are Nephilim, there are Nephilim, everywhere are Nephilim. Nephilim uh, fatigue. <laughs> Nephil, yeah. Nephilim fatigue is, uh, is certainly set in for a lot of people. Yep. Uh, everything isn't a Nephilim, and That's everything right. isn't about Nephilim. Nephilim are one variable in a very complex equation, and they they're very specific. It's a very specific phenomenon that happened on Earth in the Golden Age, and uh, continued in a post-flood context to some degree. So, um, it depends on how you define a Nephilim to answer that uh, gentleman's question. I, I think it was a a man, um, yeah. and. If you define a Nephilim, as some people do, as any aberration, uh, any genetic aberration that is not human, uh, mixed with, with, with human DNA, if that's a Nephilim, um, then we already have them here because yeah. China is making all kind of crazy things right now. Um, if you, but if you define a Nephilim specifically as an entity that has the genetic material from, from the watchers on some level, um, then uh, that's a very specific, that's a very precise definition. So in order to have a reemergence of those beings in the earth, um, we would need a preserved line, a preserved genetic line going back to the watchers, which I believe does exist in the earth. Um, uh, and that's, that's much more of a pre precise definition. So I think, I think we should, um, um, we should, widen the boundary uh, of the way we think about these things and, and, and go a little bit beyond um, the Nephilim paradigm and widen the playing field, so to speak, and allow for other entities to be involved that aren't Nephilim. Right. Um, for example, is there an indigenous race of uh, creatures, uh, in my view, most probably reptilian creatures, um, that were here before us on the earth? Right. Yeah, I think that uh, there's a very good possibility that 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 statement, that the answer to that question is in the affirmative. And I do think that uh, certainly, certainly without question, there are entities that are not human and are not Nephilim, have nothing to do with Nephilim. Right. That are uh, that are existent in the universe and exist within the hierarchy, exist within the order, exist within uh, the cosmos of the universe, the order of the universe, um, as ordered, by the way, by God. Yeah. And so, uh, but then again, are there other entities that have nothing to do with the Nephilim, that are extraterrestrial in origin, that are artificially conceived? There's a whole nother category. Isn't that a whole nother category? Definitely. How could those creatures be Nephilim? No. No, they have nothing to do with um, the the offspring uh, of, of, of watchers and, and human females uh, or anything to do with that genetic line. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that the gray aliens are from Mars mm -hmm. and, and the gray aliens are actually not the little guys. Um, the, 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 the source of the gray aliens aren't the little three to four foot tall, um, large headed, black eyed beings. Um, that in fact, those guys are the uh, are uh, drones, some kind of a clone. Dr uh, let's call them clones. Right. For the sake of argument, the, that those little guys are clones, and the and the real greys, so to speak, are uh, are are the ones that are in control and made those clones, devised, co conceived those clones through technological means, possibly using human DNA and the DNA of who knows what. Okay, so. In that case, if the greys are clones, the little guys, if those are clones, can those things be classified as Nephilim? The answer is simply no, they cannot. Neither can they be classified as demons. A alien, um, aliens are not demons. Uh, demons are, uh, the, the, the tradition, in the traditional context, a demon is, I should say in the, in, the, in the biblical context, a demon is the disembodied spirit of a fallen Nephilim of a dead, right. specifically a dead giant, um, but also if you subscribe, if you if you've subscribed to the narrative of the Book of Giants, the Watchers didn't just copulate with human women; they procreated with animals. Yeah, 
are those Nephilim? Uh, okay, uh, I suppose that th those are Nephilim as well. Um, but um, if you have uh, so the, so so and 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 the disembodied spirits of the giants, according to the Book of Enoch, are the unclean spirits. They're called the unclean spirits, by the way, in the New Testament. Yes. Evil spirits is what they're called in the book. In the Book of Enoch, so these are the these are the possessing spirits. Why do they possess human bodies? Because they want bodies. They don't have them. They're disembodied. It's torturous. This is a this is a condemnation that they're enduring. It's it's a, it's a, it's an extreme form of torture. To to you're supposed to have a body, but you don't have one. I mean, imagine that. Yeah. So you're hungry. You're thirsty. You have all the desires of the flesh, but you have no flesh. So what do you want? Flesh. And specifically, what kind of flesh do you want? that kind of flesh that is most analogous to the kind of flesh you had and, 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 and anatomy that is in some way similar. And what is that human beings, right? The, 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 what your mother was, in other words, you know, your mother's relatives. And so you're going to go after human flesh. And what do you want? You want to embody that person. You want to experience all the lusts of the flesh. That's all you want. You're not involved in some kind of a, uh, a cosmic conspiracy, um, you, you're not you're not running the Illuminati or anything like that. All you care about is getting a body. That's it. Period. End of story. Um, have you ever encountered a demon possessed person? Um, they're not the, the entities that are inhabiting these people are not uh, interested in in the Bilderberg group. Right. They're, these are these are very much like uh, the, the 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 depiction in the movie The Exorcist. These these entities just want to torment you, and they just want to use your flesh. And they want to and they want to experience the lust of the flesh and food and drink and all of that because that's all they care about. They're ravenous. That's one kind of entity. Now you tell me. I've encountered these things. These uh, these these unclean spirits. They're disgusting. They're ravenous. They're wicked. They're offensive. Uh, they're intelligent. Right. Right. Um, all they want is a body. Okay. They're sexual. They're driven sexually. They yeah, want to use yeah. your body for sexual purposes, but then they also want to damage it. Revenge. They hate their mothers. Yeah. Their fathers are the were the watchers. So they esteem their fathers. They hate their lowly mothers. So. Um, and, and the race from which they come. And so they hate their, their state, their, their situation, this cursed situation that they have to endure. They want to be like their fathers, eternal, powerful, but instead they're vagabonds. And the only thing that they can do to, to satisfy the lust of their flesh is inhabit human beings. And so they, they're, they're full of vengeance and wrath. Okay. Now think about a gray alien. Right, right. A stoic little being, this little drone being, doesn't even have sexual organs. So why the heck would you, as a demon, want to inhabit that thing? <laughs> right. You'd rather inhabit a pig. I, you'd rather inhabit a dog, a mouse. Yeah. Uh, something that has sexual organs and 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 so forth and 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 eats and 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 and, and is much more carnally oriented than a, than a than a friggin' gray alien. So, you know, um it it doesn't make any sense. That's trying to make everything a Nephilim. Right, you right. Know, so, so so the gray aliens, the only paradigm that a lot of people have is the Nephilimery. And so they gotta they gotta force those two things together in, in order for their worldview to make any sense. Which is which is what people do with a lot of different topics, by the way. So, so, so great. I can guarantee you that a gray alien has nothing to do with a demon. Now, wow. are yeah. they demonic? Well, if you if what you mean is are they nefarious? I would say that uh, abducting people and so forth that's very nefarious activity. So yes, I think that gray aliens are nefarious, and so in that sense, demonic. But do they have anything to do with Nephilim or even Watchers? You know, I know that uh, it's a popular view that the that the that the Greys are Watchers are the Watchers. I don't think so. And uh, again, I'm getting deeper into my book than I want to. But but I want you to think about something. See, see, you, you, you if you just read the narrative and you look at the story and you make logical inferences, things fit together better. Right. For example, right. 
For example, what kind of a being is going to look down at the earth and lust over the daughters of Eve? A reptile? No, not necessarily. Um, some kind of a gray alien type creature? With no sex organs at all? Uh, very unlikely. <laughs> How about something that looks like us? Right. How about, I should say, that's really not the way to say it. We look like them. Right. A, a group of beings that are very much like us. Very, very much like us. They're not us, but, but we're siblings. We're cousins. We can copulate. We're so close that we can mate. Um, and I, I, think that's, I think that's just a logical inference. Um, so you have the, the sons of God who are looking down at the daughters of men. And they're going, that's a female version of me, basically. Yeah. We don't have those here. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, how come they get those? And when I say those, uh, it's a compliment to all women listening to this show. <laughs> You're not saying those things over there. <laughs> <laughs> they're looking down and they're seeing these females. Yeah. They didn't get females. Right. But Adam got a female. And, and, and yet, and, and now they're not just jealous, they're lusting. Whoa. That right there tells me that uh, these, the sons of God are very much like us. Very, very much like, they're not us. They're not human. But I think we can accurately uh, consider them our elder siblings. They're like us. In fact, the Bible says that we're going to be sons of God, not not in the sense that they're sons of God, not in the sense that we're going to be of the exact species of what they are, but we're going to be like them. Right. It's more but, like a status instead of a, a yes. species. But Jesus says that we're going to be like them. Yeah. And then he says, being sons of the resurrection. Mm. What does that tell me? That tells me that Adam was a whole heck of a lot like them. That's what that right. tells me, because that's the purpose of the resurrection. It restores the human race to the original blueprint of Adam, but in the second Adam. And so Adam was very much like them. Is there a biblical precedent for this? Yes. He made us to be a little lower than the angels. Right. We're the younger siblings. And we're like them enough to where they can A, lust after us and B, copulate with us. It's very simple for me. I don't, I don't complicate it beyond that. So, so for me, the watchers are like us. They're lusting wow. after our women. They're copulating with them. When they produce offspring, they just look like big versions of us. Right. So you got to put two and two together. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just, again, it's logical inference. And so... Um, we're very much, you see, we're, it's, it's, it's not like people think. Let's just put it that way. It was, it's not like I thought. So reality is quite different than what we think on every level. And you know. Uh, I, I, one of our first interviews, um, uh, I, I, was, I was talking about like demons and fallen angels and aliens. And, you know, at that time, I didn't really use the term aliens to refer to anything like that. And then you, you, you rightfully so, you kind of challenged me on that for the reasons that you've already laid out in this interview. But you, you said, you know, you might want to get used to using this word aliens and here's several reasons why. You know, you told me that in an uh, email or a message or something. And, and that really got me thinking because I thought, okay. Uh, up until now, I hadn't heard uh, a, a Christian actually talk like that. I've only heard people from ancient aliens talk like that. And, you know, they, they're, they're, they're wrong and they're garbage and they're evil. So I don't want to use any of their terminology. But here was this Christian friend that I had that was, uh, you know, making some really good points. Uh, again, very, very similar to the points that you're making tonight. And so I started thinking about that. That led to a lot of the research I was doing on Leviathan Chaos and, and what led eventually led to the book that me and Derek wrote, The Day the Earth Stands, Stands Still. And in that research, it just cannot be denied. The Christian worldview, the actual biblical worldview, if, if, you, if you put off some of our traditions, you know, some of our modern traditions for a little bit and just look at the actual biblical narrative, um, it is perfectly positioned to accept a, a, a view that includes 
like you said, that have nothing to do with Nephilim or demons or uh, any of that, but that 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 includes um, other planets with other sentient beings and all that stuff who may be even interacting with us. So the, the big question of the night, I, I got to ask you this. In light of all that, because I know that this is going to be brand new to a lot of people, um, how do we parse out these these beings, these definitions, these names that we uh, uh, you know apply to anything that's not human? We have fallen angel, demon, aliens, extraterrestrial, gray aliens, reptilians, and a lot of times we as Christians try to kind of cross pollinate all these things. H how do we how do we parse this out, and how do we actually look at these? beings, if there are other physical beings in the universe, um, d does their culture have to have anything to do with us? Or if they are interacting, how do we look at that from a biblical worldview? Well, the first thing we do is we embrace the complexity. Right. We don't, we don't try and reduce it into something that is more satisfactory to our current paradigm. We embrace the complexity and we allow our paradigm to conform to reality. Uh, you, have to, you have to do that if you're a scientist. I mean, uh, we've been doing it for years. We've been updating our knowledge over the centuries, especially over the last century. Right. Updating our knowledge. And now our perception, yours and mine and everybody listening, has conformed to what we know about reality. Um, even though it wouldn't have fit the paradigm of our great great grandparents we now know it to be true things such as quantum mechanics and we have conformed and not only have we conformed to these realities we we've we've um, invented technologies that that are operating on them like the one we're using right now for example so first thing you have to do is you have to embrace the complexity don't fear it embrace it and and have an understand have the 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 you have to have the proper paradigm. First of all, your paradigm has to be centered properly. Center your paradigm on Christ, not on yourself, not on the human race, not on planet Earth, not on your conceptualization of uh, a biblical cosmology or whatever. Christ is the center of all things. Christ is all and in all. And so um, that's the first thing you do. And once, once you do that, uh, young earth, old earth, aliens, no aliens, irrelevant. It no longer, it no longer matters to your, uh, to your paradigm as it relates to the gospel. And um, so that's the first thing people have to do. Is do not have a human-centric paradigm. That's the major problem. Everybody, almost everybody has a human cent Christians, I mean, have right. a human-centric paradigm, have a Christ-centric paradigm. That's, that's, that's uh, essential. And then um, allow yourself to make logical inferences, even if they're uncomfortable. And let things be what they are. Right. And um, it, don't try and force everything into the same narrative. Um, don't try and make everything a Nephilim. Um, don't try and make everything a demon. Yes. Uh, there's the, the universe is complex. How do I know? The earth is complex. <laughs> right. Uh, there's nothing simple about physics. Right. The fundamental nothing. building blocks of our reality is nothing but complex. And we, we don't fully understand it at all. <laughs> and just because we don't have to understand it. That's to right. Interact with it. That's right. Uh, I mean, mathematics is 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 not simple. Uh, right. ast astronomy is not simple. But all these all of these things are realities that that we all interact with every day. Um, biology is by no means simple. Human biology, for one thing, billions and billions, trillions, I think it is, uh, of cells, at yep. least billions, um, in your body, all operating. How? You're not giving any of these cells orders. You're not telling them what to do. It's only within the last 100 years that we've even begun to understand the constituents of human biology at the cell cellular level, level um, uh, let alone at the subatomic level. So um, everything is complex, okay? That's rule number one to understanding the universe. Right. Everything is complex. And the problem is you have, and by the way, 
it's not just three dimensional complexity. It's hyper dimensional complexity. Yes. So it's even more complex than we can conceptualize. We can't even conceptualize most of what's out there. I call it perceptual da- dark matter. Yeah. So, so most of the stuff around us is perceptual dark matter. And so we have this limited biology that's in a degenerate condition. Adam was much more spectacular than we are. We have this limited, broken down biology with which to interact with the world and understand, comprehend the world around us. So we have a problem of perception. I call it perceptual cataracts. We have perceptual cataracts. Paul said, we see as in a mirror, dimly or through a glass, darkly. Guess what that is? That's cataracts. That's right. We got scales on our eyes. We have perceptual cataracts. Yep. That's what I call it in my book. And and so we're seeing through a, a mirror dimly. We can barely make out the contours of reality. And, and, and besides that, we have, we have, uh, a, a ver- we have um, <laughs> poorly functioning brains yeah. to boot. We're, we're not all that intelligent compared to a, a rat. Yeah, we can celebrate our intelligence compared to a, ramp or e- a rat or even a chimpanzee. But... Uh, compare us to the elder race, compare right. us to our elder siblings, and we look pretty stupid. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, we have a problem of perception. By the way, Adam, uh, this does not pertain to the original blueprint of humanity. This pertains to our degenerate condition, the human condition of sin and death, degenerated over thousands of years. This is what we are now. So now we have technology. That's great. That helps us understand things that we couldn't otherwise understand. But, but our ability to process information has declined, has, has exponentially declined since Adam. Uh, and our perceptive capabilities have exponentially declined since Adam. Okay, well, here's a problem. We're not entirely, quote unquote, physical beings. Mm-hmm. That's right. We know that we're not. So why can't we perceive the other part of us? It's yeah. there, but why can't we perceive it? Why can't we see? It's, it's because of this perceptual cataracts. So we can only perceive very little of the universe around us, and we can only comprehend very little of the universe around us. You put those two things together, and we've got, we've got the problem. So, so that's why when the Son of God comes to the earth and, and is among men, he talks to us like we're little kids. Right. With parables. How does the maker of the universe communicate to us? Um, he do, well, he does so in parables, and he does so communicating to us in a way that is relevant to what we can perceive. He uses simpler stories to reveal complex truths. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the point is that he delivers the message. And what's the message? The message is the gospel. And that is crystal clear in the Bible. I can hand uh, uh, the Bible. To, uh, let's say this. I can give the New Testament to my 13-year-old son and, and, and tell him, read this and then tell me what it's about. And I guarantee you, he may not get all the details. He's going he's, he's, he's to miss a lot of the theology, but he's going to understand that this person, Jesus, is central to it, very important, died on a cross, and so forth. Very true. And that is, by the way, the, that is the mystery, the fellowship of the mystery, understanding the redemption of the human race. That is something that was hidden from the angels until it was revealed in Christ to men. And so, um, so we, have, uh, we have the capacity to understand the gospel. We have the capacity to receive the theological messaging from the Father. But to go beyond that, it's very difficult for us because we have all we have we have this problem this this problem of perception, and um, and so what we tend to do is we tend to uh, we tend to create contrivances to fill in the gaps. We because of our uh, perceptual impairment, because we see the world in shadows, and because of our reduced capability to process information, because we're fallen and we're degenerate. Uh, we we have these gaps in our knowledge, and what we've tended to do is we've tended to fill these gaps in with 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 contrivances and superstitions. And so now that we ha- have the technology to investigate the questions that were beyond us in the past, 
we're slowly repaving those ruts in the road, those gaps in our knowledge, upending the superstition and having an understanding of what is actually occurring. That's happening in the natural world with science. And it's also happening, I think, now in a theological sense, because we have an understanding of things that we did not understand before. And so when you begin to contemplate the universe and the possibility of these other entities existing and, and understanding the kingdom of heaven as an empire and understanding that, uh, they're, 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 the, for example, um, is there such thing as angelic, quote unquote, angelic technology? And the answer is yes, of course. Right. And is it primitive? Are they riding around on horses? Well, why the heck would they be? We don't ride on horses. So why the heck would they? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we ride in, we, we use the best technology we have uh, to, for conveyance, for communication. It's natural. It's logical. So why would we be different than them? We wouldn't. Yeah. Period. We're not. So they're using advanced technology. Their civilization is very old. Their technology is very advanced. Their knowledge is very great. And, uh, and they're not us. They are, in, in effect, an extraterrestrial civilization. In, in, in every sense of the word, some of them are loyal to the emperor, are loyal to the king, and some of them are not. Right. There is an insurgency. It's factional. There's war. There's conflict from Genesis to Revelation. There's a battle ensuing. And, and, it's, it's, and we're involved in it now. And we have a choice. Are we going to embrace the king, be loyal to the emperor, or are we going to join the insurgency? And joining the insurgency is... It happens when you reject the king. You're either with him or against him. So, um, you know, this is the reality around us. This is the world in which we live. This is the context, the dynamic that's happening, whether we like it or not. And things are far more complex than we think. We have all this perceptual black matter that we can't see, but it's there nonetheless. It's just like the quantum world. We can't see the mechanisms at the quantum level, but but they're working. It's the reason why we're communicating through the Internet. That's it's right. Because of quantum mechanics. So uh, uh, we've been able to, even though we haven't been able to understand these things fully, we've been able to wield them and make techno control them enough to get technology out of them. And so uh, my my goal, and, and forgive me for rambling, but my goal is... is um, to help people, to, to help prepare people's paradigms uh, um, for the things that are going to be happening in the future, for where we're going and what's going to happen. And to basically to grow up, we need to grow up. Paul tells us that. Uh, Paul tells us that uh, uh, basically he's, we're infantile, that our knowledge, our prophecy is imperfect, our knowledge is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, and that's the resurrection, then we're going to understand, even as we're understood. We'll that's understand right. like Adam understood, and even more so because of Christ, uh, uh, our kinsman, redeemer. And by the way, I'd throw this in there. Uh, this, this really blew my mind when I thought about it, although I've, I've known it for, for, for since I was a little kid. You know, I grew up in the church. And so, um, you know, Jesus... Jesus is what we're going to be, not in terms of who he is innately, but in terms of what he is. The resurrected Christ, we're resurrected in him. And so we're going to become like what he is in terms of the resurrected body and so forth. So um, here's Jesus, again, who became a man like us, in a resurrected body. He suddenly appears in the midst of the disciples um, uh, after, after the resurrection. And they're all astounded and scared, remember? And, and they're, they're so frightened. And, and Jesus says, don't be afraid. Um, touch me, he tells them. Touch me. See that I have flesh and bones. In other words, because he said, the, 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 uh, spirits don't have flesh and, and bones. Touch me, because I do. Right? So they're touching him. That's they're right. feeling his hands. They're, they're, you know, they're seeing the wounds in his hands. They're feeling his hands. He's flesh and blood. And then he says this, do you have something to eat? And they give him some bread and some fish, and he eats it before them. Why? To further verify that he's still human. He still has flesh and blood. He can still eat and drink. So 
we we have this misunderstanding that you know some somehow in a future context we're all going to be spiritual just spiritual beings something somehow something other than human no in the future at the resurrection what happens is we become truly human that's what happens and um restored to the blueprint and so here's christ human post-resurrection appearing in the midst of the disciples just appearing materializing he's flesh and blood he eats he drinks and then he disappears again so what i'm trying to say is this we can't comprehend nor can we perceive nor can we interact with the totality of created order but it's there nonetheless we only have an, a paradigm right now to view it as physical spiritual physical spiritual that's spiritual this is physical i'm telling you the two it's two sides of the same coin they're both part of the same synergistic whole Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. And it's 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 difficult for human beings, I think, sometimes, though, though we need to do this, we need to at least try. It's difficult for human beings to understand that there is a larger reality surrounding the reality that we currently live in.